Hi everyone, um, my name is Ruth. I work on content here at Civil Practice. Thanks so much for joining us here and for our Ask the Expert webinar where we'll be talking about measurement-based care. We're joined by psychologist and our very own education director, Lindsay Oberleitner and psychologist, Max Maisel. We're thrilled to have both of them here for this lively discussion about measurement-based care. We have an hour today, so, and a ton of information to um, get through. Now diving into the agenda, first we'll go over some logistics, then I'll let Max and Lindsay introduce themselves. Max will lead us in discussing the definition, benefits, and concerns of measurement-based care, including a measurement-based care case review. Then Lindsay and Max will both be answering your pre-submitted and live questions. Finally, I'll jump in at the end to answer frequently asked questions about simple practices, measurement-based care feature. Now for our legal disclaimer, simple practice does not provide insurance, billing, or legal advice. The views and opinions expressed by the presenter are not those of or endorsed by simple practice or its affiliates. Before we get started, I just want you to all know that we are offering CE credits for this webinar, which is very exciting. After the webinar, attendees can take a quiz and fill out a satisfaction survey on the Simple Practice Learning site. You can follow the link below to start the process and find out more about our sponsor approvals. Note, if you are not a Simple Practice Learning member, you'll be prompted to sign up for a free account before proceeding to the quiz and survey. Having a Simple Practice account doesn't mean that you're a member of Simple Practice Learning. It's a different um, site. And no worries if you can't write down that long URL. You will also find the link to get the CE credit in the Docs tab to the right of this chat box on your screen. The link for the CE credit will also be emailed to you along with a recording of this webinar and a copy of the slide deck. If you're a simple practice customer and have any questions related to measurement based care feature um, that we just integrated on our site or any other simple practice feature, I'd recommend visiting support.simplepractice Dot com, which is also linked in the docs tab. One other thing to note is please do not try and go through the process of getting CE credit until the very end and until you've seen um, the whole webinar um, so you can do that successfully. Now for some webinar logistics. If you look to the right of the slide presentation in this webinar, you'll notice the chat box. Many of you have already started to make great use of this chat box. It's a good place for you to discuss the content with each other, but also a place to report any technical issues you may be having. While in the chat box, if you look up and toggle to the second tab titled Docs, you'll find some of the resources we've made available, including an article with more information about measurement-based care, our help center guide on how to use simple practices measurement-based care feature, and the link to get the CE credit for this webinar. As mentioned before, we'll try and answer as many live questions as we can. To submit a live question, toggle over to the Q&A tab, which is the one, the third one to the right. And now I'll turn it over to Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm really excited uh, to get to be here today with Max. Um, and I'm really excited to see the spread of places that so many of you are joining us from. So just to briefly uh, share a little bit about my background uh, before we get started, and I pass this over to Max, I just want to share, um, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Michigan. I am also the education director here at Simple Practice and uh, Simple Practice Learning, where you can go for CE credits later today. 
Um, I, before joining Simple Practice, I was faculty at Yale University School of Medicine, um, as well as running a forensic drug diversion program and practicing in addiction, chronic pain, uh, and criminal justice broadly. Um, really excited. I think the topic of measurement-based care is so important as we think about how and where we're continuing to move as a field and how we continue to improve practice. So thank you again for being here. And with that, I will pass it over uh, to Dr. Max Maisel. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And it is a pleasure to be here with you all today to nerd out on measurement-based care. Um, my name is Max Maisel. I'm a clinical psychologist in Los Angeles in Redondo Beach. And I run a small group practice and we mostly work with people who struggle with OCD and OCD related concerns, a lot of tics and threat syndrome, body focus, repetitive behaviors, that sort of stuff. Mm, I definitely am a self-proclaimed measurement-based care nerd, and I get very excited talking about this stuff as you'll probably see throughout the workshop. Um, so I'm really grateful to be able to share this space with you all today. Um, I wanna spend a couple minutes talking about why I'm giving this workshop. So I got my PhD from BYU in Utah, and two of my mentors, Dr. Michael Lambert and Dr. Gary Burlingame, are some of the leading like spearheading researchers in measurement-based care. And what that means is from day one, I was inundated by measurement-based care. Every clinical hour I had, every practicum um, setting I was in, it was measurement-based care all the time. And that's really how I was socialized into learning how to use measurement-based care in therapy. And I remember it was a really interesting experience after my postdoc, when I opened up my own private practice, I didn't have measurement-based care like in with how my framework operated. And the feeling I had was like, I'd been piloting a therapy airplane and all of a sudden I lost radar. I lost like the nuance and the depth and being able to foresee obstacles and being able to um, see where clients are going in therapy. And it was such an interesting experience. And I was able to reintegrate measure-based care and made a, a huge difference. But hopefully in this workshop, um, I can, Lindsay and I can get you all excited about ways that you could integrate measure-based care. And hopefully you can see that really does make a, a big difference in how we work with clients. So we're going to briefly go over some definitions. Um, measurement-based care, you can think about it as a systematic evaluation of patient symptoms before or during an encounter to inform behavioral health treatment. So essentially what that means is we're choosing something to track, right? Oftentimes that's some sort of outcome measure or symptom, but it could also be a process of therapy. It could be tracking the relationship. It could be a specific therapeutic principle or process that you're working on with the client. But not only are we monitoring, but we're monitoring very consistently, talking about every session, every other session. So we're getting a lot of information and then we're using that information, integrating it into the broader therapy with our clients. So it's a very like dynamic, collaborative, active way to do therapy with people. Um, if you think about like a doctor's appointment or physical health, most physical health concerns, there's some sort of measurement-based care happening. For example, if you think about somebody working on lowering their blood pressure, they might be having a blood pressure cuff and getting the results and using those results to inform their care with their doctor, right? That might be changing exercise or medication or diet and nutrition but they're using that blood pressure number and hopefully being able to see it go down over time and talking with their doctors about a way to make that happen. And essentially measurement-based care and therapy serves a similar purpose where we're collecting data, we're collecting important information and using it to inform where we go with clients. So a couple of years ago, Barbara and Resnick came out with a really seminal article that was one of the first papers that really operationalized what we think about when it comes to measurement-based care and they provide a really cool definition but i really like their paper because it's not just like a, a definition but it's actionable and they outline the three specific steps that anybody needs to take if we want to think about what measurement-based care is so um, here's a little printout from their article and i'm going to briefly review it but i would encourage all of you to check out their article or um, look at this printout a little bit more closely for details because it's really really good so there's three phases. There's collect, share, and act. In the collect phase, we're doing two things. We're giving our clients a solid rationale of why we're going to be doing measurement-based care, what it looks like, right? So we're giving them, they need to understand the importance of it. Um, and of course, getting consent to do measurement-based care. And then selecting a measure 
And again, it needs to be collaborative. I'm not serving as an expert telling a client, oh, we're going to track X, Y, and Z, but it's part of a broader discussion. Like what makes sense? What do we really want to focus on in our work together that makes sense to monitor over time? The share element, not only me as a therapist, am I going to be interpreting the results of the assessments, but I'm going to be talking about it with my client. I'm going to be checking in with them. Your PHQ-9 shows that your depression is up a couple points from last week. Does that resonate with you? Is that how you feel or is it different? So we're really creating this collaborative working relationship where we're not just relying on assessments, but we're talking with our clients about it. And the last part is ACT. So once we have collected information and we've shared it with the clients, how is that going to inform what we do together? Is it going to be business as usual? We keep on going how we're going. Is there some sort of change that we need to make in terms of goals or treatment plan, or maybe we want to start measuring something different? So it's like with that information together with the client discussing, how do we want to go forward? Um, measurement based care is one of those things. If you start looking into the research behind it, um, it is so clear that it's very, very beneficial. It's one of the most like empirically based things that we have. Um, there's unequivocal evidence that measure based care helps, it helps increase effectiveness in terms of outcome, um, helps create change quicker than without measurement based care. And, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next two slides is it helps us therapists detect and prevent treatment failure, right? Which is a big one. So, um, there's a couple proposed mechanisms of action out there, and this isn't a comprehensive list, but there's papers that have talked about why measurement based care probably is helpful. Um, it holds the client and the therapist accountable. I'm not going to be working with a client on a goal or two for weeks and weeks or months and years and have either no change or worsening without us talking about it. Right? So we're really going to be on the same page in terms of what's happening and what clients are getting out of therapy. Um, it really helps to increase our clients' awareness of what's going on. If we're having clients fill out and discuss a specific measure often, they're able to really get a sense of how their inner experience is ebbing and flowing and changing throughout the course of time. And it really is a powerful intervention in and of itself for that. Um, it really helps with the therapeutic alliance. So we know in outcome research, common factors of therapy are kind of get the most bang for a buck in terms of change. And the therapeutic alliance is actually a little bit different than the therapeutic relationship. So the alliance means is what I'm working on in therapy as a therapist, the same thing that my client wants to be working on. Are, are we on the same page in terms of goals? And you can have a really good relationship, but a really poor alliance if you're not on the same page. And that has a major impact on the work that we'll be able to do. So in defining treatment focus and making sure we're talking about the same stuff that feels relevant and important, it really helps make sure we're on the same page and I'm working on what my clients want to work on. And then finally, it enhances clients' expectations of treatment, right? If clients can see that I care enough about their mental health, to put in the time and effort to track and to monitor and to talk about progress, you really can't help but feel a little bit more hopeful that, you know, my therapist knows what they're doing. Like, this will be okay. Um, and we know in terms of like placebo research and expectancy, the more hopeful clients are and the more bought into therapy they are, the better things are going to go. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the some interesting things. So as therapists, um, I think we need to feel efficacious. Like we need to feel helpful. We give so much of ourselves in this work. And I think it's a really good thing for therapists, for us to feel like we're, we're doing our job well, we're helping people. That's why we're in this business. But at the same time, it's so clear that we have our biases, just being humans. And without measurement based care, there's risk that those biases might affect clients in ways that we're not even seeing. And the research shows that therapists generally aren't very good at predicting who's going to fail in treatment. We call that a deterioration case. And we know generally five to 10% of all clients will deteriorate in treatment. They won't stay the same. They won't get better, but five to 10% will get worse. And there's a really interesting study in 2005 at a counseling center where they had a bunch of therapists over a couple of years, try to predict 
which clients would get better. And this is not using measurement based care. They were just trying to predict out of the 40 clients in that study out of 550 who ended up getting worse, not better. Only one case was accurately predicted. Everybody else failed to foresee that coming. Also, generally, the expectations therapists had were better than the actual outcomes. It showed about 40% had positive findings, whereas therapists predicted it would be 91%. Interesting enough, in that same study, they use an outcome monitoring called the Outcome Questionnaire 45, which is one way to do measurement based care. And using that assessment, that assessment specifically predicted 100% of treatment deterioration, right? Being able to track in a statistically valid way over time, uh, ca caught all the cases that deteriorated, whereas therapists were only able to catch one of them, which I think when I first heard about the study, that kind of blew my mind a little bit. And I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not quite as good at predicting things as um, I hope that would be. And then another interesting study by Wallfish in 2012, they surveyed 129 mental health professionals and they asked them to compare themselves with colleagues and peers. And essentially, every single therapist in that study said that they, their effectiveness as a therapist was above average compared to their peers. And if you know anything about statistics and a bell curve and what average means, that is like statistically not possible. Um, and, but, and again, I want to be clear, I think it's, we, as therapists, we need to feel helpful and efficacious, but we do tend to overestimate, I think, how helpful we can be. And moreover, 58% um, of the therapists believe that 80% or more of their clients would improve. And again, that does not match up what the research shows. And 25% of them believe that their skills were in the 90th percentile. Again, if you know what the 90th percentile means, the fact that 25% believe that they fell in that range is not possible. Right? That's not how averages work. And then almost half, a little bit less than half of the therapists in the study predicted that none of their clients would regress. Or I guess they didn't predict. They said that none of their clients had regressed. And again, 5 to 10% regress. And if you're not using measurement-based care, if you're not tracking, how would we know? Right? We're sort of left to our own biases. So, I mean, I think the long and short of these studies is knowing that we do good work and we care and we put ourselves out there. But if we're not careful and if we don't follow the science, some clients will fall through the cracks, right? And for me as a therapist, I don't want my clients to fall through the cracks. I want to help as many people as I can. And measurement-based care is a really cool way to do that. Um, so here's some common concerns that we see with measurement-based care. Um, one of them is administrative burden, right? It takes time and energy um to do this work and Lindsay, i'm wondering if you have any thoughts about this because no in the presentation you gave you talked a little bit about the administrative burden and how that comes into play yeah absolutely thank you max and i think such a nice um overview you've given already to think about how this all can can feel sometimes when we take in this information right it's so hard sometimes when we sit back and hear these numbers that Sometimes we don't predict as well as we think we will when we see these numbers. And I think, you know, when we're looking at things like administrative burden, I think it could be really interesting how we perceive that, right? Anything that we consider to be that burden, time, energy, taken away from the core part of our practice, which is really helping people feel better to reach to reach those goals, to make those changes. And you know what? It, it always strikes me that those two things in balance, all that information you just, you just presented showing how it does work and how sometimes our expertise alone isn't enough to show us all of those things, makes that change feel a little different, right? Like that, is it an administrative burden or is it, you know, in your words, actually part of something that causes change. And I think it actually tips those scales a little bit when I take those things in comparison, but it does take time, doesn't it? I'm sure Maxie and I both, and I'm sure many people here can think about, I can think about the times I've sat and thought like, I need to put some real value on this measure to keep doing it, to take the time to remind and explain to a client how important it is, yep. but to also step back and say, I'm gonna score this, I'm gonna integrate it, I'm gonna talk with them. And if I don't believe in that it's worth that value, it sure does potentially feel like a burden 
So, you know, I think it, it's complex. I wonder what your thoughts are with that, something that you've integrated so well into your own practice in an ongoing way. And as you mentioned, it didn't start that way necessarily in private practice, but you had to make it happen. Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, it's also true. And I think really come back to my values of wanting to be a helpful therapist and wanting to do the work with my clients and knowing what the research shows about measurement based care, it, it helps even on that burden. And as I go through it to simple practice, um, the easier things can become like Lindsay, you know, I were just talking about this old school paper and pencil assessments. And that certainly is more of a burden and time and energy, but now with like simple practices system and, and other ones out there, it does it kind of all for you. And sure, it's going to, there's going to be some burden and time, um, but it, technology can make things so much easier and so much more simple. And I think it is outweighing like, well, it's going to take a couple minutes before session, a couple minutes during talking about it, but there's some really amazing benefits of it, um, which to me yeah, has made all the difference in the world. So, um, yeah. And then concerns about utility and practice. I think I covered that one where if you do a Google search review on the effectiveness of measurement based care, it's like pretty, the, the questions answered, like, yes, this does help. It's helpful in many ways. Um, we'll talk more about getting clients on board with measure completion, but I think with like what Lindsay was saying and providing a good rationale, if we explain to clients why we're doing this, how it makes sense, having it be a collaborative process that helps with that. Um, feeling like it doesn't address key client concerns. Um, if it doesn't, then you're not doing measurement based care, right? This, it needs to, that needs to be part of what this work is, is making sure we're on the same page with our clients and, um, the lack of consensus of measures piece, and that can go hand in hand. And we'll talk a little bit more about how much people might find measures and what makes sense to use. But at the same time, there's, there's so like, you can make this work for you and your practice and your clients. And there's so much cool stuff out there that you can start playing around with. Um, driven by external forces, like organizational demands, insurance companies can be problematic, right? And my hope would be, again, if you're doing measurement based care, that sort of force on you by it, external circumstances that at the very least you're able to like make it yours, right? To be able to do it in a way where it doesn't feel like it's being forced, but it feels like you're actually able to use it in a helpful way. And it can't be cookie cutter, right? You have to find a way to make it work for you and for your clients. Um, before we jump into the case example, Lindsay, any thoughts or follow-ups on any of that? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things, Max, again, thinking some of the things you shared with us before now and thinking about these common concerns, I think sometimes that piece of feeling like it's not hitting your key client concerns can be a big driving factor, mm -hmm. right, and how people feel the usefulness of MBC. But I think from if we go back to some of those earlier pieces you said, it's so important to think through like, well, where does this fit in? And maybe it isn't you know, depending on what you're tracking, depending on how you're doing it, it might not even be that you're just tracking a particular diagnosis, right? And the symptoms that go with it. It's more like, does what does this mean to the client? And what does this mean to their own? You, you mentioned it briefly earlier, that idea of like bringing some insight to themselves and seeing the value of the tool more than just this outcome on a diagnosis where we can get lost and think like, oh, this doesn't match exactly. But instead thinking like, what's the experience and how are we helping clients gain insight through different tools that we can use? Um, so, you know, I think it's again, one of those, like as we go back and forth between these, these are fair concerns. I think we've all, I much like you, kind of developed with measurement being so core to what I did in practice. Yet at the same time, there were times in my own practice where I thought like, my goodness, this does feel like another checklist. And I think these concerns to me always strike me much like you said, as like, then something's not going right, but it's not that measurement based care doesn't have utility. It means maybe how it's being done doesn't have utility at this moment. Maybe what you're doing, how you're thinking about it. Maybe there's a new lens to look at it through. Um, so I appreciate you raising all these concerns. I bet probably most of uh, most uh, everyone on the call and myself as well have experienced many of these concerns for many reasons. I think the cool thing is they're not reasons that have to stop us, right? They're new views, new ways to take and move forward. So thank you for sharing all of those, Max. Yes, absolutely. And it, I mean, it's sort of like any, I think anytime we do something new or make a change, it's uncomfortable and it's hard. And as the human mind works, we like to find excuses why not to do stuff. 
And the if measurement-based care isn't something that any of the folks in here do often or consistently, it does get easier. And it's become so self-reinforcing because you you start really understanding the benefits and clients tend to really like it. Um, so it's one of those things that I think it, it's a habit that we kind of work on. And the more we do it, the more we want to do it. Okay. So a case example. So I changed a lot of this client information, um, changed identifying information. I, I altered details. So if anybody thinks they recognize any of this, they don't. Um, it's my little catch all. So um, this is a case uh, of like how typical case that I see in my practice of how I use measurement based care. Um, a female in her 20s that we'll call D presented to my practice for concerns of anxiety and OCD. During our initial assessment, she verbalized concerns about having unwanted intrusive thoughts related to fear of harming uh, family, friends, and her dog, which is very common in my line of work of like harm-based OCD. Um, she felt her depression was subsequent to her OCD where she was withdrawing from people and she wasn't spending as much time with her dogs and that was naturally leading to depression. So in her mind, it was like the OCD first and the depression would probably get better once her symptoms alleviated. So in the collect phase, I explained to D what measurement-based care was, and we discussed using it in our work. I'm not sure if you a rationale I might need today. So, so D, we talked about how impactful and just how much suffering your OCD has caused you. And um, I really want to take this work seriously. I want to make sure that the interventions that we're doing are really helpful and we're moving towards the goals that we talked about. So what I like to do is there's a, a assessment called the Y box or the Yale Brown OCD scale. And what we'll do with the Y box is it'll give us a number and that number will show how severe your OCD symptoms are compared to like other people who've taken that Y box. And we're going to give this assessment. It's going to take a couple minutes. We're going to give it every other week. And hopefully what we'll see is over time, as you work on your OCD and chip away at the hold it has over you, we're going to see that Y box number going down and you'll be getting better. And if we don't see it going down, if it stays the same, or if it goes up, gets worse, that's, super important for us to know. So we'll talk about it and we'll be able to evaluate what we want to do with that. Um, and say, how does that sound to you, D? And usually almost always people are like, yes, like let's, let's do that. That sounds like a great idea. Um, so with D, we, we decided to do the white box every two sessions. Um, and I gave it to her the first session, which we'll go over in the next slide. Um, we scored it together and talked about what that means. I also gave her the PHQ-9 to measure depression. We weren't doing that as measurement-based care and the fact we weren't going to do that like every other week, but I wanted a before and after measure of depression just so we can like make sure we're keeping our eye on it. And she scored cut off of mild depression. So this is a brief example of the 10 questions of the Y box of this measurement-based care assessment that I use often. Um, the 10 questions, there's a scale from zero to five for each question. So zero would be not severe at all. Five would be extreme. For example, I won't go through all of them, but the first one, time D spent occupied by obsessive thoughts. It would be like zero, none at all. One, mild, uh, less than an hour a day. Two, moderate, one to three hours a day. Three, severe, three to hour, eight hours a day. Four, very severe, um, eight to 12 hours a day. Five, extreme pretty much nonstop 12 hours plus a day of this has stopped. So it's like that zero to five for each of these questions. You can kind of see what, how she rated each one on here. Um, and then the, the scoring severity for the Y box, just so we know it, zero to seven is subclinical. Um, eight to 15 would be like a mild OCD. 16 to 23 would be moderate. 24 to 31 would be severe. 32 to 50 would be extreme. So Max, as you're sharing, and I know you're going to share more about this example, I'd love to hear, like, what do you think about when sometimes I'd imagine if she saw and you were sharing back out a little bit of this initial screen of the numbers and, and where she was landing, her experience of this as well, was this something that kind of helped give her insight and she connected to? Was this something that you had to kind of work through? Was it surprising? And what do you do with that? Those ranges of responses people can have to seeing these things and kind of, you know, on paper, black and white or on the computer, you know, yeah. um, but seeing it as a hard number. Yeah, for sure. I mean, most people um, feel 
validated, very validated. Like, oh my gosh, you're asking exactly what's been in my mind, right? Especially if you choose like the right measures that make sense. And for a lot of people, it feels good. And for a lot of people, it feel it does feel surprising too. Like, oh, like that hits, that connects. But I didn't, like a three on, uh, let's see, like time spent performing compulsions. A lot of that is like a three would be it's actually interfering with my social family school functioning. So for them to be like, wow, I'm like taking inventory of like the taxes it's taking on me, that could bring up a lot of stuff and it could be surprising, but in a good motivating way. And for the why box, since it is a pretty in-depth one for the first session, I actually went through it with her and we processed and we talked about what it means to her. And then for the remaining sessions, when she sort of got it and understood, I gave it to her before she could do it on her own. So we necessarily go into the nitty gritties, but the first session, I do like to spend more time on it. That's awesome. Thank you. I love that. That's like you brought in that example of like, we go to the doctor, we get blood pressure. We normally get to hear those things. So I think so powerful how you're talking about taking that time to kind of dig in from the start about like, what does this mean to you and what does it look like? Thank you yep. for sharing. Yes, absolutely. It's a really good question. Um, so that was a clut, right? I gave her the rationale. We gave the why box. We talked about it in the share phase. I shared with her, right? So D, you got a 30, which is in the severe category. How does that feel? Does that match? Do you feel like it's like severe in your life? Yes. Like it really is. And oftentimes people feel so validated by that. And Lindsay, like you were saying, we can go through and link the responses to information that we talked about, right? Um, D was most concerned about how much time her compulsions were taking up and how it put her social life on hold. Um, I like asking process-based questions sometimes with clients, like what was surprising to you? Um, what did you notice while you were answering these questions? And again, depending on your time and bandwidth and goals, like you could spend some time on this stuff, really kind of getting clients to think about it and process it. And at the end, you mentioned feeling very hopeful and motivated that all this stuff was out there. In the act, we decided to pursue exposure and response preventions, like the gold standard for OCD. Um, and one of the questions on the why box, which is particularly clinically relevant, is, uh, let me go back for a second. Number seven, how much resistance does D put against compulsions? And three is I put very little resistance. I kind of just let the compulsions happen. So we use that as a starting off point. Well, let's talk about why that is, what's scary about resisting compulsions and starting to come up with a, a way to chip away at compulsions. So session four, her Y box had dropped to a 20, right? So 10 point drop. So she's doing quite a better, still a lot of OCD. Um, share, I'm checking with, does this make sense? Do the thoughts feel less sticky? Do you feel like there's improvement? And she agreed. It feels like it's been helpful. And act, we decided, keep on going, right? We're doing the right stuff. Things are getting better. Session eight, her Y box had jumped up a little bit, right? And this is really important for us to talk about. And Dee was unsure why it had dropped up, but she agreed with it, that things have felt stickier. Her intrusive thoughts have been more pervasive. So we talked about it and we found out that a couple of things had happened. She had midterms coming up and there was life stress in terms of, I think she had a, a breakup. There's some relationship problems and that led to a lapse, right? And would I have caught this if I didn't do the Y box? Maybe, right? But maybe not. But by being able to do something consistently, we're able to really make sure we're tracking and like talking about this stuff with the clients. And then act, we, we agreed to focus on increasing social support. We integrated a stress management in our exposure response prevention work. And we talked about our feelings about the breakup and just processed what that meant to her. Um, she was also able to practice the OCD skills she was using to navigate some of the harder emotions with the breakup, which is really cool. I love that, Max, just to yeah. add to what you're sharing yeah. there with that case. I love how you took the time to really focus in on, you know, what does the jump mean, right? You mentioned earlier, we're all looking to be effective, but in many ways, by you taking that time to like really focus in on like when are those moments it's not going the right way, we can problem yeah. solve. Is it us? Is it something going on in this case with the client? And also what I love that it highlights in this case that you shared is it brings up that idea that there are things, one, that we could miss, like you mentioned, and two, sometimes I always think about how hard is it, how hard is it for any of us when something's not going as well? You know, there's still an impression bias. Our clients even experience sometimes it's hard to fight that they want to show that they're working hard, that they're improving, yeah. that if they really get along with us, they like us, they have that good alliance. It can be hard to say, actually, things are getting worse right now. So I love that it both 
you know, as you bring up these points of how helpful that can be to take that time to say like, it's okay, right? Like it's okay if it goes up. In fact, great chance to work through this yep. and it will happen. So um, yes. I just wanted to highlight how, how I like how you really uh, brought that into the, the yes. session. And, uh, and it could go, that's such a good point. It could go the opposite way too. If somebody is reporting that their symptoms are like really mild, but what they're telling you in session is that they're a lot of things are really hard, a lot of stressors, like that's a good conversation to have, right? And maybe, and like, what can we learn about that in terms of like how vulnerable they are, people pleasing tendencies, right? There's a lot in there that we can use. And so as Yalom said, right? Grist for the mill. Um, so it's a great point. Um, and then session 16, um, her OCD had dropped down to a 10, which is still technically OCD, but it's very mild, right? I'm usually pretty comfy starting to wrap up around a 10. As long as people know like how to take it forward. Um, I regave the peach Q9 and she wasn't depressed anymore, right? She felt better. And again, we shared, she said, yes, that resonates. I'm feeling a lot better. I'm getting to play with my dog. I'm going to parties with friends. I'm like living my life and that's going to really help. Um, in sharing, we also talked about some of the anxiety about wrapping up. Like what does it mean to start winding things down and um, what we're going to start doing with um, relapse prevention. And then act, and I think this is like really cool when this happens, where we agreed to spend a couple more sessions really solidifying treatment gains and focusing on relapse prevention. But during our ERP work with D, we had uncovered more like childhood trauma, neglect, and emotional abuse that led to interpersonal concerns that weren't OCD, but were a different issue that she wanted to work on. Um, and that allowed us to shift, right? We're going to not just terminate after OCD, but we're going to focus on doing some deeper work working on some of these really hard experiences she had. And we circle back to collect, right? And we decided, well, we're going to use ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy to really help increase overall flexibility and how she responds to trauma memories and hard feelings and interpersonal concerns. And we use the PCL5, again, as a before and after measure, just so we can get a sense of her trauma symptoms. But for measurement-based care, I love the AAQ2. It's the acceptance and action questionnaire. That comes from ACT acceptance commitment therapy, and that's a measure of psychological flexibility, right? So how am I able to behave in certain ways that are congruent with the ACT model? And you can track that over time too, right? It's not, I'm not doing a symptom anymore, but I shifted more towards like a theoretical way in how we're working together. Um, and then the last thing with this case is you can map it out with clients, right? And you can show clients over time on the Y axis, that's her Y box score. And the X axis on the bottom is it's every other session, right? It's when the Y box was administered and you can see, and this is like such a cool thing to be able to process with clients as it happens, how like there's change and there's the up. And again, there's this, when you're in that share phase, there's so much you can talk about and collaborate with clients. And a lot of people really like this, right? It's like so validating to the work that they put in, which is pretty cool. Um, I love how you yeah. put that kind of chart together, Max. And I wonder, just in asking a little more about how you do that with your clients, is that, do you do you present um, kind of the findings across that way? Are you sharing the numbers? How do you do that kind of share piece about the numbers and talk about it? Is the visual something important to how you practice? Is it something you only do in certain times? I love hearing a little more. It's a really good question. It depends. It's like the classic therapist answer like it depends on the client and how much of a visual learner they are or how how much like motivation they have for the measurement based care um so sometimes i will go through and like we can kind of watch the trajectory usually it'll be more of an informal conversation about how things are going and then like towards the end or a little bit like once a month once every couple months we can kind of like look at the more broader trajectory but if you're doing this like for sure during like termination or approaching termination i would definitely pull something like this out. But for some clients, they find it really helpful to see it a little bit more regularly. But I usually don't do like show them the graph every single session or every other session, but some clients do find it helpful. Again, especially if they're very like visual individuals. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I think it is sometimes like you see those numbers and you're right, it depends on who it works with, but being able to be like, is there something I can track and see? Because all of us have a hard time holding in mind, how did I feel two weeks yep. ago? We have a hard time holding in mind how did I feel two days ago sometimes, right? So see like an hour ago. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> an hour ago, 10 minutes ago, some days, right? So, thank you. Yeah, yes. Um, so should we jump into the the pre-submitted Q and A's? Would that be cool? Yeah, I think so. Let's get started. Um 
So, so Max, let's start off with, are there other assessments besides the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7? And how do I find the right assessment tool for my clients? Yes, there's a lot of them out there. Um, I would say the, the biggest thing is, for the most part, we want to use assessments. We don't just want to find one on like a pop psychology article. We want we want them to be evidence-based. We want them to, to be sensitive to change. We know that they measure change. We want them to be statistically reliable and valid. Um, and there's a couple ways, a couple hacks that you can use to find them. Um, so Beidas, B-E-I-D-A-S et al., 2015, they came out with an article. It's called Free, Brief, and Validated. They have a ton of awesome measurement-based care tools in their article. So you can look up Betis 2015, um, and they have a lot of cool ones. Um, you can also do a Google search, right? Measurement-based care for couples or routine outcome monitoring would be another term. Routine outcome monitoring for relationship. But you'd want to be careful, right? I wouldn't just take the first Google result. You want to like do your due diligence, go on Google Scholar, make sure there are research studies and reputable journals showing that these are really helpful to track, but that can give you some ideas on ways to do it. And then you can use your colleagues and professional organizations, right? Use your community and find out what are other people using that are evidence-based that tend to track what you're trying to track. For example, in LA, we have LACPA, the Los Angeles Psychological Association. They have listservs and meetings, and it's a good way for people to share ideas on what they found to be helpful. Um, organizations, like if you have a specialty, for example, for me, the International OCD Foundation, um, that organization, that website has very specific resources that are legit, that are kind of gold standard assessment measures. So you can kind of find governing bodies of what you want to work on. And often they have really comprehensive resources of different sorts of assessments. Yeah, I think that's great. And I love sharing. So you shared out some very specific resources of where you can find those. And I think it is so important that it's really hard sometimes when we don't know where to look to find like, what are those good measures? Because things pop up all the time. But you're right. It matters a lot what measure we use if it's really going to work for what we think it's going to work for, for the person sitting in front of us too, right? Whether that's by age or uh, reading level, or there's so many things that can influence that. And, you know, and just thinking of some other groups that have started to put out some lists we can think about, um, you know, American Psychological Association's mm -hmm. measurement based care. So you can just search in there's, there's a few there. But what, you know, I did want to add a little on the PHQ-9 and GAD-7 as those are very specific in the way that one, I think some of the strengths of them and why people use them often, I'm coming from working in community mental health some years back, and we integrated all of those measures in part because they're a great communication tool and they're used so widely. But the other thing is there's some really cool research coming out on them that shows, although we thought they were tied very specifically to diagnoses, they actually seem to be pretty tied to like symptom distress. So they can be used across a whole lot of different concerns that individuals are presenting with us. And sure, it doesn't capture everything and it doesn't get into those kind of fine-tuned pieces. But if you're thinking about like, how am I going to get started? I think these measures are a, often a good starting place. Yes. But as you mentioned, then as you dig in deeper for any particular client, you might be digging into some very specific specific measures that meet those needs. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I think that the PHQ and, and GAD, you're right. I, I have been reading some of the, the newer research too. It's pretty cool um, that they, they they can be used as broader measures of like distress and, and change, which is in terms of like measurement based care, kind of what you want. So that's pretty neat stuff. Right. Yeah. I love those ideas of where can we find things that kind of will work for many of our clients that give us a good sense. And then, you know, sometimes we start with a set, you know, I, I know some people in practice who have like their core set and then they actually design what MBC will look like for each individual client with that client feedback and that understanding of those experiences and some set of those continue, but some regular assessment of those can be really valuable sometimes. So um, I, you know, I think, I think both are true, right? There's some real value in integrating those two as kind of core, often use good communication tools. We know a lot about them and a lot about distress and then adding into some of those more um, very specific measures. So I think having a mix, having a lot that you've explored and starting to explore yeah. can be so helpful in practice, right? You don't want to, or 
I mean, we obviously can be there, but it can be really challenging when someone walks in and we're like, okay, I really want to track this particular area, you know, from my own work of chronic pain, what am I going to do? You know, this is an add on to, I'm probably still going to keep doing the PHQ-9 and CAD-7, yeah. but I really want to track those symptoms in addition. Yes. Amazing. I thought so. I know we have quite a few questions. Maybe we could pop to the next one if that sounds good to you, Max. Yes. Um, so can you use measurement-based care when working with a longer term client? Oh, I love this question. So go for it, Max. Yeah. Yeah, for, for sure. <laughs> like, absolutely. And again, I think, I think a lot of it just depends on like your goals with the longer term clients and like what you want to work on, what you want to measure and also to be able to track things over time. So it's, it works very well. I might, um, if it's like a long, long-term client, like a couple, couple years, I'd probably give it less often than I would like a shorter term, like right? a good classic 12 to 30 week kind of protocol. I want to do every other week, or every week, somebody for years and years might want to do it once a month. The research isn't exactly clear on like how consistent we really need to be. We just know it needs to be like more often than not, but that would probably be one of the biggest changes I would make. Um, Lindsay, do you have any thoughts? I'd love to hear. Being able to, I think you're right, right? Like what's that frequency? I think the other thing is sometimes with longer term clients, the really cool thing, it strikes me as the case that you shared with us too, that there can be these moments where I mean, for many people, again, I, I'm sure in a lot of work you do focusing on OCD, for myself coming from the world of substance use disorders, chronic pain, more chronic health conditions in the, the, the conditions that I most often am treating individuals with, we do see ups and downs, even when things are going really well. So being able to continue to integrate measurement-based care can be really helpful. What I love it as, I always tell people, I always kind of had this idea that I'd talk through with anyone where it was like, my goal is always like, okay, if I'm talking about substance use, for example, I want to help you start catching the things that you saw, maybe you saw depression increased a couple weeks before, um, you know, your drinking went up again. So what I always want to do is keep being like, okay, can we get closer? Can you get more insight by using these measures of you know, I find one of the most amazing things about these tools is like a PHQ-9. Not everyone, we may realize that sleep problems are related to mood and other mental health symptoms, but our clients don't always, right? Irritability, they might not always associate with that feeling of depression or other triggers and being able to like really use it as an insight tool that I find really helpful in the long term too. And being able to like be like, okay, this is going towards I might be heading towards some increase in my pain because I've seen this pattern before with the measures. So I feel like they they hold some real utility in the long term. And sometimes even I've had clients who I saw many years later who said they continued. Some of our measures are freely accessible, that they actually found it valuable to look at the tool and be like, oh, am I missing something about myself, right? Am I missing something that's worsening that I'm not automatically noticing? Yep. Yes. Oh, amazing points. I love it. Should um, we jump to the next one? Yeah. Let's see. Can I use my own custom assessment? Sure. Why not? <laughs> so you want to be careful because a lot of the, like the PHQ, not in the GAD, these are like, there's so much research. Like we know they're sensitive to change. We know they measure what they're intended to measure. That doesn't mean you can't use your own custom assessments. I, I do all the time. For example, I work with a lot of ticks and threat syndrome, and we use like a zero to 10 tick thermometer, especially for kids. And we're going to kind of track their ticks over time because there aren't really good, quick, easy tick assessments that I can do in that much of an integrated way, but I'm going to put a lot less weight on it, right? I'm going to be using it more specifically just in terms of like what's showing up versus some of these other measures. I'm going to be able to make a lot better kind of like um, predictions off of what that means and sensitivity to change. So you can for sure, but we just have to be careful, right? And I wouldn't put as much weight in them as I would on some broader measures. And I probably would want to do both, right? Give them like a more evidence-based measure, even if you're going to do it less frequently and come up with your own more like idiosyncratic measure that makes sense given what you're talking about. I love that, Max. Those are really important points, right? There's by no means any reason we have to rule out anything that we want to track over time, but exactly that weight that we put in it is so important, right? Whereas we know some of our tools that have years and years of data to show us like this can predict something, this looks like individuals who are struggling in this way, that's really valuable uh, to be able to compare it to, to understand, to know you're really, I mean, I always go back to those really 
basic pieces of like, it's reliable. Can we get that same measurement again and again? Does it mean the same thing to the client? Is it really assessing what we want? But there are things that might be so helpful when we're helping a client gain insight that we bring it in, right? Like could be something like, I don't know, even they they just relate better to, I've had even adult clients who are like, I want an anger thermometer. I want to talk about it. I want to talk about those peaks. And the other thing is just to step back from this, the difference between assessment and measurement-based care. Assessments are what we use within measurement-based care. But when we're talking about measurement-based care as a big picture, it of course can include things and may someday include more biometric assessments and self-reports and clinician, you know, involved, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> understanding and ratings of things that it's really that process of collecting, sharing, acting, working on it together that can take us so far. Um, so I think it's kind of cool actually to think where could this head over time that it's more than only assessment, though assessment's the core, right? It's the core. Um, some of our very, very clear assessment measures, but it could be so much more. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And I know we, time goes so quick. So I'm going to jump to the next question, which is I've noticed that my clients vary a lot in how honest, accurate they are at filling out assessment screeners. Well, I already really like this question. Such an important one to consider. How should I work with the ones whose results really don't track with what I'm seeing clinically or what they're reporting in session? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, so many thoughts on it. Um, I like, and this shows some more service level, but um, sort of like, I'm always curious as to how clients are like interpreting the like instructions of the tests. Sometimes like the instructions will be measure this over the past week and they might be thinking like over the past year and that might inherently create a mismatch so i just talk with clients first about like how they're interpreting what what this means what they're keeping in mind when they're answering the questions just making sure being curious about their experience with it um and then yeah like kind of we were talking about before i think it's it's grist for the mill it's something to be really curious with clients about and be like part of the conversation because it's it's meaningful it means either like there's some sort of misunderstanding or there's some sort of like clinically relevant thing happening. So I think when that occurs, that potentially is like a goldmine of different like therapeutic tools or just clarifying the instructions of the assessment. Right. Absolutely. I love that. So many ways uh, to go into this. I am going to jump ahead now as we move to the live questions. Oh, sorry. Um, so we only have a moment, so I want to make sure to get through what we can here and address some of these. So how might you address the common experience of clients that sometimes things like symptoms get worse before they get better when starting therapy, at least in trauma therapy and honestly, lots of, lots of treatments, right? As we start to address things, I worry that clients may feel discouraged if they see things worsening according to measurement. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, I think valid, right? I know in my life when things get worse, like that might lead to uh, like feeling the sense of like defeat or hopelessness. Um, and in those cases, like, I think as with all things in therapy, we want to have a good relationship with our clients and we want to have space to explore it non-judgmentally curious ways. And I think in, in this question, it really shows so beautifully how we can integrate therapy and the work we do with clients with measure based care. Cause probably if they're feeling discouraged and that's triggering like a reaction or a trauma response based on measurement based care probably coming out in different parts of their life just in terms of feeling defeated or dejected in other ways so i think it's just it's really like useful to have that conversation and tie it in to other things and being mindful right if you really feel like your client can't handle it where they're at then like maybe you hold off on the share part or maybe you like share in a way that's really mindful of how your client's feeling um, until I, I would use that as like an indicator for myself, like kind of get to the place where we can have this conversation. We can feel some of the feelings. Um, so again, I think thinking and being thoughtful and considering the person in front of you when you're doing this stuff. Yeah. I love that, that it's like, how do you manage it in that moment? And also, you know, just one other side that I sometimes think about it, actually, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I also, 
I try to inoculate people. I love that term, inoculate, coming from some of the more, but to say in advance, like, we're going to do these measures and they really are meant to learn. And sometimes the learning is some things are working, some things aren't. Maybe it's actually that, you know, I do a lot of emotion focused work too. And I'll say, I actually expect that some things will feel worse sometimes in session, sometimes yeah. after, before they get better. Um, but it actually means you're engaging with this and you're starting to do some of that hard work, but actually starting to address that. Um, I don't know if there's anything, do you, is it something you think about in the pre or is it something that you more focus on kind of as it comes up? I think there's a range of answers. Right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Some things you can't anticipate, right. And like um, you can include it in your consent form that filling out measures might bring up feelings and you can like let people know as part of like the collection part. But then I think part of it's like being present with people and being able to navigate it based off of your overall conceptualization of what's happening. Absolutely. And I think this is probably the last question that we'll be able to fit in. But how do you use MBC alongside of medication when medication is introduced alongside therapy? Yeah. So I think there's like specific like measurement based care for medication, like like more of like a psychiatric way, which is not within my domain in terms of like chemistry and biology. It's not necessarily what I do. Um, but in terms of therapy, I think it just like tracking any sort of change or any outcome, it's the same thing. You kind of like keep it in mind, note it, um, continue to do the work. And again, I think for a lot of clients get stuck on this the medication, is it therapy, I don't know. And again, using that, processing it in the broader therapy framework is always a good idea. Yeah. And I think sometimes it can be so cool. What I love about measurement based care when you showed like graphing things yeah. is I always love to put like important time points. So this can be something where you're like, here's where our treatment approach really changed on this kind of calendar of where I'm seeing symptoms. Here's where medication started. Here's where we think medication was probably, you know, two weeks post initiation, say, um, probably at its peak and being able to use those as extra inf environmental information. We're pulling into that kind of charting and graphing yeah. of things. Yes, exactly. And you spark another thing, like in terms of the apt phase, right? If like people are sort of like plateauing or getting worse and they're not on medication or they are on medication, even like in terms of your treatment plan, that might be an issue. It's like, do we need to start medication or do we need to like change medication and have a talk with a psychiatrist or a prescriber? Um, so that could be a, a helpful way to keep track as well. Absolutely. Bringing in that collaboration. Yes. I think we are going to do one more. So um, I find my older clients are not excited to use technology and have a hard time even getting them to sign their treatment plans. Any suggestions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is, um, like I said, really. And first of all, I love this question because it's, it's so mindful of the person you're working with. Right. And like their demographic, culturally, where they're at, age. Um, so I think for any measurement based care, we need to be culturally sensitive and like recognizing that people are going to take these measurement based cares in different ways. And I think like this is where some of the creativity comes into play. I wouldn't want to like not do measurement based care because of these concerns. Um, and what's about if I'm seeing them in person, then that might be an instance where I do the old school paper and pencil version of it. Um, I might do it with them the first couple of sessions just to sort of like guide them through how to do it, get them a kind of like inoculation. Like you said, Lindsay, help them feel more comfortable with it. So I, I would really like want to do it, um, but I might have to like be creative and find unique ways to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you brought up that kind of cultural sensitivity to it as well, because it's such a part we need to understand from the time we're picking those measures, right, to thinking about how we implement them and how we, ex how a client in front of us is experiencing it, but there are so many ways like you've shared and we've talked about to do measurement based care that it's not a it's not a stop to it. It's a how am I going to do it different? Right. Yes. Um, but it yes. can absolutely be, I think, all of those options reading. I have even though obviously we want to use scales as they're intended to be used. There were times that I'd see people while they were still incarcerated and I would literally read a response scale or I'd yeah. write out the response scale and like read item by item. Um, even though it, maybe it's not the ideal, if it's the closest to the ideal we can get, it can still be so valuable as long as we take that into account of how we buried it. Yes. I think with that, Max, um, we are passing it over to Ruth. Thank you so much. Um, this was so exciting for me too, to get to learn and hear from you. So thank you. And I'll pass 
Ja. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you both so much. What an incredible conversation. So much insight that was shared. Um, and I appreciate everybody else coming through as well. I just wanted to go over a couple of frequently asked questions um, about the simple practice measurement-based care features specifically. So for now, the GAD7 and the PHQ9 are the only measures um, that can do tracking in our product. However, stay tuned for more. Um, we'll definitely let you know if there are any updates in the works um, or um, coming out. So is it available on all plans? Yes, our measurement-based care feature is available for all customers and trialers. What does the feature offer? It offers a variety of different functionality, ability to share measures with your clients track your clients' responses, um, set reminders. So set reminders for when you'll want to share that uh, measure with them and automatic scoring interpretation and visualizing scoring over time, as well as high risk alerts um, in place if scores um, dramatically shift or reach below a certain point. And then how do you use me the measurement-based care feature? So the measurement-based care feature, there are a lot of different ways to, to use it. And also there are some steps involved. So I'm gonna leave that to uh, the guide that we've provided in the docs tab to the right of your chat box. So um, I'm gonna refer you over there. And last reminders, right? At Thank you all so, so very much for joining us. Thank you, Max and Lindsay. That was such an amazing presentation and discussion. And we hope to see you all at our next webinar.